thank you for that. And it's really a pleasure to share this weekend with all of you, and really an honor for me. Um, over the past couple of years, our team has been really searching for neurotechnologies that can dramatically accelerate mindfulness training. And so over the next couple of minutes, what I want to do is explain to you what I mean by that, and also give you a sense of why we're interested in this in the first place. Um, so these are some heartbreaking statistics that you can find on the internet. This is a counter that's counting in real time the number of opioid deaths since about the end of 2017. And it's especially heartbreaking when you realize the effects that it's having on children who are born into this issue. Now, these are only numbers for our home state of Arizona, and so obviously this is a large issue that the whole nation is facing, but just looking at that small snapshot um, should be motivating enough to want to do something about this issue. And so we've been working with the University of Arizona and the University Medical School to try to find interventions that not only treat the clinical symptoms, but we also want to find cognitive training paradigms that give patients the cognitive and emotional skills that they can take back into their lives to lead healthier lives and to have healthier minds. Um, so you can guess what we're looking at. We're looking at mindfulness-based interventions. The science on this is still pretty young, but we do know that if you create a mindfulness-based intervention and get patients to go through an eight-week course, you can reduce the clinical issues, uh, for this case, craving and the number of uses of the drug, like opioids, um, and that tends to lead to well-being in the patients. Now, why is that working? Well, what's happening is that patients are developing what we call mindful awareness. This is a famously hard thing to operationalize and quantify in the lab, um, but this is one of the definitions floating around. So it's a form of awareness that is present-centered and has a flavor of non-judgmental uh, nature to it. So uh, that's been hard. There's been multiple definitions that are proposed for what mindful awareness really is. But what seems to be clear from the science is that what's underneath these transformations is the cultivation and the training of attention. And so we've been working with a well-known meditation teacher, Shinzen Young, who's actually here. You can talk to him. And I think he's developed a really beautiful model of mindfulness, which basically says what mindful awareness really is, is the training of three, at least three core attention skills. Uh, so they're here. Take sensory clarity, for example. This is your ability to track in real time sensory information with high resolution and high detection. Um, so I used to play baseball. There's been a lot of perceptual science on baseball, professional baseball players, and we know that they can track a baseball with very high resolution and detection, and they can hit a ball moving at 90 miles an hour. Now, the claim, obviously, is that that's an attention skill that can be trained, and it's being trained in baseball players, and that when we're training this in patients in the clinic, and they're training all of these attention skills, that's what leads to efficacy. So when they apply that form of attention, to their clinical issues, like craving. It breaks up the craving and breaks the automatic behavior linked to behavior, and you get positive behavior change. So, okay, why am I not ending there, right? We should just create a mindfulness paradigm, give that to our patients, and we're done. Well, as most of you know, if you've tried mindfulness on your own, it's initially very difficult. So you read about all of these benefits, you've read about things like enlightenment, you see the Dalai Lama, and then you sit down at the pillow and you don't get any of that. Actually, you probably got the opposite, and so you give up. Now imagine patients who have opioid addiction, who are trying to come into the clinic, uh, they're having to pay for that time, it's very costly. And so what we were motivated to do was try to find technologies that facilitate the training, that we then hypothesize should facilitate the clinical benefits. And if we can find something that's powerful and safe, it'll reduce suffering on a very large scale. And so with that, we created the Similab at the University of Arizona, uh, so and in collaboration with the Center for Consciousness Studies. And this is Shinzen here uh, being a model for us. What SIMA stands for is Sonication Enhanced Mindfulness Acquisition. So really, this is about helping patients acquire those attention skills. And we're using a form of technology called transcranial ultrasound. So we're focusing uh, a very low intensity beam of ultrasound into the brain. And because it's highly focal, we actually have to uh, use MRI to guide it. So that's Shenzhen's brain behind him there guiding the ultrasound. 
Now, this is a relatively old technology that's having a resurgence over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And it's, it's really a great form of neuromodulation because you can focus a very, very low intensity beam into the brain and you can modulate brain activity and brain function. Uh, so many labs are developing this. There's labs here at Stanford that are doing great work. And what we thought is if we could target certain brain areas and certain brain networks, really, that are involved in acquiring these attention skills, these mindfulness skills, we can help patients induce mindful states in the lab and then learn those attention skills so they can get clinical effects and bring that back into the world. And so what we were doing here was targeting uh, the anterior cingulate cortex. This is our first study. That part of the brain is really involved in conflict monitoring. So when you're sitting down to meditate, you need to monitor your attention and see what's trying to grab it away. And so we thought if we could take healthy undergraduates, sonicate that area of the brain, we may be able to induce a mindfulness state. And that's exactly what we did. So on the left, these are the subjects who got sonication. This was double-blinded. Um, moving up the scale basically means you're reporting more mindful awareness. It's a validated scale. On the right, um, it's the placebo condition um, on your left. And basically, we found no effect for these subjects. Now, this lasted for about two hours. We followed up. Subjects were fine. Many of them wanted to come back and do the study again. Um, but what this demonstrated is that we could actually stimulate um, or induce mindful awareness in the lab. But remember, we don't want to just induce mindfulness. We want to help people learn these mindfulness skills. And so the hypothesis that we're testing now in patients is if we can induce one of these states, like sensory clarity, can we actually help patients learn the other ones faster and lead to faster clinical effects? Um, so we've designed a two-month protocol where we teach people the mindfulness techniques. Uh, they get the sonication sessions while they're doing the meditation, the mindfulness. And then they get personal support throughout the whole thing. Um, so we want to make sure they have both psychological support and support by trained mindfulness teachers. This is a group uh, connected to Shenzhen called Unified Mindfulness. And the, the support is really to help them integrate these skills back into their lives. So not just to get the clinical reduction uh, with what's going on with them, but also take this back into the world. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. If we can show that this works for addiction, uh, we think that this will then be applicable to pretty much any clinical disorder that we apply this to. And why would I make such a big claim? Well, that's because if this mechanism is true, if we're actually helping patients learn these attention skills, and it's really the attention skills applied to the clinical issue that's leading to positive behavior change, which is sort of what we're looking at now, then that paradigm should be applicable to chronic pain as, as much as to addiction and as much to eating disorders and depression and everything else in the psychological dimension. And so the long-term plan is really to take this paradigm into different clinical issues. Uh, but of course, it doesn't stop there. If you can lead to positive behavior change, you then will lead to well-being as well. And so Shenzhen has developed this really nice model that has a sort of um, a broad explanation for the categories that make up what we would call well-being. And so we're also trying to devise scales uh, and measures to quantify what we mean by well-being broadly and deeply defined. So that's very exciting. Um, so here's Shenzhen again, uh, modeling our newest prototype that we've developed over the past few months. So the transducer, the ultrasound transducer, is on the back of the head. It's targeting the default mode network here, the posterior cingulate. Um, what you see is we have headphones so we can pipe in the mindfulness training. So the subjects are actually doing the training while they're getting the sonication. And then ultimately, we want to be able to record brain activity in real time. So we've just recently done this in the scanner, because you can do ultrasound in the scanner simultaneously and take MRI. Uh, but now we want to take it out into the clinic, record EEG, and look at the brain changes in real time to make sure that we're modulating the brain in the, in the direction we want to modulate it in. But ultimately, we want to take those signals and feed it back into the ultrasound to trigger the ultrasound. So we're creating a closed loop system. Uh, the point here is to do as little possible ultrasound as possible to get the clinical effect, to get people to learn those mindfulness skills and break the link to behavior. Um, so, so far, what we've done on a very shoestring budget down in Tucson, uh, we've done a couple neuroimaging studies. We're looking at safety to make sure both behavioral and uh, neurological, we're doing the modulation we want to do and not leading to any negative effects. And we're also looking at efficacy. And so here at BrainMind, uh, what we're looking for are collaborators that can help us do the best science and use the best neuroimaging methods possible. Uh, also, we'd love to talk to ethicists about this. Uh, we want to be very careful 
and really to think through what we're doing for patients and make sure we're moving them in the direction of well-being and not some other direction. Uh, and of course, we need funding to fund all of this. So uh, I'm going to leave you with the motto of the lab. It's develop the skills, develop the mindfulness skills, optimize happiness, deeply and broadly defined. Thank you very much.